Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TV Enthusiast discussion of uh, the comic book shows, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Arrowverse. Uh, we talk about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., The Flash, and Arrow on this show. Uh, we talked about Supergirl last week. We won't talk about it this week. Maybe we'll talk about it later if some kind of a big event happens that really merits a lot of discussion. But right now we're focusing on shows that are kind of more interconnected be, with more stuff. I'm to be honest, I did not watch Supergirl this week. That, that works out perfectly. <laughs> yeah. We could talk about that on the podcast if you guys want to talk about it, but until until there's something kind of more substantial happens where any connection it does have to the you know Arrowverse or something that is potentially connected, I don't really see a reason to talk about it here. I mean, Oliver um, Queen and Barry Allen suddenly show up. <laughs> well, and I think also it's still finding. For me, it's more it's still in very much a stage of show I want to enjoy and not yet show I enjoy. So hopefully yeah. we'll have more to discuss if it reaches that that stage. It's still a little too on the nose for me. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> I think it's better than the pilot, um, but it's still a little too on the nose um, with, the, with the issues it's tackling. But uh, let's get to the actual show. This is uh, TVE versus Marvel and DC episode uh, 5, I believe. Yes, 5, episode 5. Uh, so we're going to start off we're going to talk about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. the episode we're going to be talking about is Among Us Hide, Season 3 Episode 6 in which we found out the identity of Lash dun 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 so this, this puts like an interesting wrinkle because oh, initially when I thought you know that there was a strong possibility that Andrew actually was Lash um, I thought that it was the possibility was likely that they weren't aware of each other, you know. Mm-hmm. So, but this puts everything Lash has done. Maybe a more of a Hulk like situation. Yeah, right. and, and this puts everything Lash has done right squarely on Andrew's shoulders because it's clear that that is not the case. Yeah, it's clear <laughs> that Andrew is one hundred percent aware of what he's doing as both Andrew and Lash, and that. So there, there's no, like, this confusion, like, oh, I turned into a monster, I don't know what I'm doing. He is fully <laughs> in control at all times. If I and had the time, I'd be going back and re-watching all these episodes. Just <laughs> it, it makes you reconsider all of his behavior. So yeah. I'm excited to see where it goes. And I have to say, I actually saw it coming, because after um, the episode two weeks ago, I was like, especially with everyone, everything I was reading out in line, I was like, there's a very high possibility, yes, that he's going to turn out to be Lash, but that mm-hmm. didn't like ruin the surprise for me at all. I was still really excited by it. I think because I'm excited at the story possibility. I think they did it well by having uh, um, Von Strucker like basically dying and <laughs> yeah. having it be kind of his last terrified admission. Um, right. I think made it like really work, you know, because you're like this is an unsympathetic character, but he is terrified. He's like out of his wits scared, you know, talking about yeah. this, and it just kind of adds to the impact of it, so I think that really helps. Well, and it was, and, and May being really the one well. that's hearing it, too. Yeah, and they built toward it really well, because I do remember about halfway through the episode going, I'm starting to think that Andrew's story was a lie. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad it was. <laughs> his comment about leaving, or, or not his comment about, but it, just him leaving that happened off screen um, between the two seasons. Um, he was with May, and then he left, and all we heard about was that he was with May, and then he left. We didn't actually see anything on screen, and there was wasn't much of a you know meaningful explanation given to it. Um, do you think that that means that he turned into Lash at that time as part of the whole fish oil thing? Or oh, do you think this is something doubt. he's been all along? No, without a doubt, because there's never been any hint at all of Lash even existing prior to this. Mm-hmm. And um, and the timeline is perfect as they went away on vacation right around the same time that we know the ter- Terrigen Mist was accidentally released. And then we know that, as she put it, you disappeared off the face of the earth. So I, I, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind. Because when she first said that, I thought, oh, maybe he turned it into into an inhuman. I think it makes perfect sense. 
Again, again, like the interesting thing is uh, knowing it's Andrew doesn't still doesn't do much to explain his motives, like to explain why he's hunting down inhumans. Well, we, but the, we don't need to know that yet. We can find yeah. that out still to come. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is something because I, I just his thought, job like, at Shield right now is to determine if people are fit for duty that yeah. are potentially dangerous. So that kind of ties into what Lash is doing, deciding if people that are potentially dangerous are fit for living. Oh, that's <laughs> true. That's a good way to put Possible. it. Possible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I feel like he's going to turn out to have more complex goals than that. I hope so. Yeah, I, I mean, so. I think I think this season of Agent of Shield has um has has moved towards uh, uh more positive directions than I would have anticipated. I think <laughs> you know the example of uh, Simmons being on a different planet versus going basically, you know, Dark Phoenix style uh, <laughs> was something I feared that she was she was going to do that last season. At, like at she was going to get so glad that didn't happen. She was going to get swallowed by the monolith and then come out like. In like uh, goth makeup and like black clothes. Yeah, <laughs> so listening to the Cure. Just you know, yeah, leave me alone. To... You don't understand me. <laughs> I'm Dark Simmons now. <laughs> <laughs> I go by the name Dark Pain. That's my Dark... that's my goth name. Oh, well, thankfully. It was handled much much better than that. <laughs> yeah. So definitely. Um, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt on, on what they're going to do with Andrew, and I think there's a lot of interesting possibilities. Like I said, it would be cool to kind of go back and, and look at, you know, how things are developed. It might be something I'll do closer to the end of the end of the first half of the season, or maybe during the hiatus. Um, just kind of rewatch the episodes and get a kind of different perspective on it. I think there is the possibility that he has been Lash even before and, and that his disappearance had to do with the sudden eruption of new Inhumans and him having to leave because of that. Him Maybe going like, oh, so. something's going on, I gotta get I out of really, here. I don't know, I really don't think so. I, there would have been some indication of it beforehand. I mean, right. Unless, unless his Lash thing. persona is something that he just wasn't using. Like, it wasn't like but, he was... But, then he, but at the very least, he would have known what Inhumans were, and he would have been able to tell me, hey, that situation in Bahrain was involved Inhumans, and, and no one had even heard of Inhumans at that point. I, I disagree. I really don't think it's at all plausible. I, um, I think it's unlikely as well, but I think that there is that possibility. Um, there's a lot There's a lot of ways they can kind of cover it. I'm hoping they actually do something that actually shows that, that uh, moment in which... Uh, they parted ways, May and him. So, and we can kind of get like a clear picture of of not just uh, him reacting to probably reacting to becoming an inhuman at that point, but how he came to these kind of decisions. You know, because right now it's like he made a pretty big leap to just decide he's suddenly judge, jury, and executioner. Um, it would be cool to see like what inspired him to do that. You know, right beyond just becoming an inhuman. Next week. Because they they strongly handed that in a preview. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, we'll have to see kind of what's going on with that. Uh, meanwhile, we also got to see uh, a new higher higher up guy in, involved in Hydra, um, seeming to be in opposition to Ward, but then also helping him basically at the expense of. Uh, <laughs> okay, I feel like it really needs to be drawn attention at this point. That that guy was played by Powers Booth, who yes. played a member of the Security Council in the first Avengers. So I don't think it's implausible to assume that he's supposed to be the same character that a member of the Security oh. Council. Oh, yeah. There's also, there's also, you know, when you bring that up, you know, we also had the appearance of, uh, you know, the president of the United States for the MCU, um, in yes. uh, well, yeah, played by the same actor who played it. That so, was a cool carryover. so that having both of those, I mean, because that is such a small connection that happens. That, is such, or, yeah. I, that, I, I, that, that makes it even more likely act, that, that you're right. Act, that. Actually, they were they were building him up as like like probably probably one of the most senior heads of Hydra, aside from Von Strucker, maybe. So like it makes sense like he's a member of the Security Council. 
because he is just that high up. He is just he's that deep into the system. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, so that is that's actually a pretty but cool. He, yeah, he he could be connected to Hydra, but he might not even have ever been in Hydra because all those records came out, all their personnel records, and he didn't suffer anything. Apparently, oh, I mean, maybe he's in hiding and <laughs> he was exposed. <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be. He him. seems to be in tr- in charge of uh, quite a bit of power. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of kind of possibilities there. That's kind of interesting. Um, we'll have to see where they go with that. Uh, let's see what else we have going on here. Well, we have a uh, Holson working closely with uh, the ATCU woman. Um. <laughs> oh, or may, may, maybe some kind of romance starting to bloom there. Well, I think they kind of nipped that in the bud a little bit. It's hard to tell. I actually am really liking the way this is being written because I feel like I don't know how I feel about her, and I feel like that's the point. But yeah. I feel like they're doing a really good job of making her ambiguous because her whole explanation for why they're putting those Inhumans in suspended animation, even though I think my instinct is to not agree with her, I, her logic is very sound. And That's a very excellent a fundamentally well-intentioned place. And, it, it's, and, and I think there's a fair amount of inhumans who probably would say, yes, I would love to be cured of this. So I'm liking that even though I suspect she's ultimately going to be on the side opposite of S.H.I.E.L.D., I'm, she's a much more complex antagonist than that. Yeah. yeah, I'm liking that she's she's not just evil government agent woman, and that she actually it's it's a lot more complex, and that you can't easily discern where she stands, or or you know, like you you can't just say she's the bad guy, because mm-hmm. she actually has valid points and valid reasons for doing what she's doing. It's a very X Men esque storyline. Yeah, uh, I mean, in I humans in general, is very X Men. But just the idea yeah. of like coming from this position of like, you know, we want to find a cure, we want to help them, and then that the kind of problematic nature of that, and how X Men <laughs> always kind of connected to this idea of like something similar to like a Holocaust like event. You know, it starts off, you know, we want to help them, we want to cure them, and then it becomes we need to identify and number them all, you know, and label them so that we know <laughs> yeah. who they are. And then and then it gets to, well, you know, they're the labeled type, so they're not actually they don't oh, have human rights, you know? Well it's, it's no surprise they're treating this in an X Men S manner because this is basically it is the new X Men, yeah. yeah they're, they're, <laughs> Even in the comic books, oh, yeah. Please don't yeah. say that. Please don't say that. Inhumans cannot replace X Men for me. Well, okay. it already uh, is in the I, comic do, books. I agree with you. I get what you're saying. I think Inhumans are how the MCU is compensating for lack of mutants. Yes, At yes. At the same time, granted, I've only seen the Cure storyline presented in X Men in two different ways, and one of them involved Apocalypse secretly using the Cure to turn mutants into horsemen. And the other was the government with not so good intentions like, <laughs> trying to cause strife for mutants. One key thing that I wouldn't be surprised if is not involved in this storyline is that, and I thought Days of Future Past did a nice job of kind of fixing this problem with the cure, which is that in the X-Men universe, taking the cure is seen as basically um, denying a huge part of yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. He is is um it's a it's a metaphor, right, for for disenfranchised minorities. So it would be like giving a black person a cure to turn them into a white person. It would be Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't yeah. Or like in a realistic know. way, it's like saying, you know, bl- encouraging black people to straighten their hair and, you know, do these kind of things that are more like you know, to to fit in more with like the way white people are, you know? Yeah, yeah, and I don't see them going that direction with Inhumans. I could mm-hmm. be wrong. I kind of hope they don't because I feel like we've been down this road so many times with X-Men. So Inhumans shouldn't just parrot X-Men. It should be its own thing. So apparently, speaking of what Tyson was saying, speaking, yeah, in the comic books right now, they got this whole storyline going on with the X-Men and the Inhumans where there's this big Terrigen mist cloud and it's creating a lot more Inhumans, but the Terrigen Mist Cloud is also like dead, 
deadly to mutants, so it's killing the mutants. And that's a big storyline, and apparently I saw a, a headline on IGN yesterday where Marvel was going to do No More Mutants Part 2. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so I'm like, are they really going to... They're just constantly on the threat these days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also think, I mean, um, the new run of the Inhumans is actually called the Uncanny Inhumans. Yes, um, it is. Which is something that was reserved before for... Uh, um, X Men. It was the Uncanny X Men, just like how we had, you know, the Amazing Spider Man. You know, well, it's uh, and there's also been Uncanny Avengers too. Yeah, yeah, but well, they're they're really it shows they're really putting this kind of they're putting their their previous X Men focus towards Inhumans in comics as well. Oh, don't say that. That's gonna make me super depressed because I yeah. know there's all these fears among fans that since. Marvel doesn't have the um, movie rights to X-Men, and they're not getting any money from that, that they've kind of been pulling back a lot from X-Men in the comics and in favor of other properties, and that's a really depressing thought. I, I have more faith in Marvel than that. Like, I, I, don't, I think they are doing that, but I think they're doing it in a way that's more along the lines of they're playing with fan expectations of that. Like, I think what they're doing is they're moving in that direction, but, you know, nothing's ever permanent in, <laughs> in Marvel Comics, you know? They could kill off their entire cast of characters, and then, you know, next, uh, next run starts, and they're all back, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think they're, they're exploring the what? idea that would of, never happen. I think they're exploring the idea of Inhumans becoming more dominant than mutants, and, and exploring that concept because of the kind of connect with the MCU and what's happening with that. But I don't think they're going to say, like, okay, and from now on, you know, <laughs> mutants <laughs> are nothing to us, you know? I think they're just exploring that currently. Right. I guess we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I mean, if nothing else, I mean, it, it's not like as if the old comics have been retconned or they don't exist anymore, you know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so, do we have anything else to talk about with uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Um, I feel like we've covered it. Yeah, we, we covered that pretty well, I think. Let's move on to The Flash, then. So, the episode of The Flash we're talking about is The Darkness and the Light, Season 2, Episode 5, in which we discover that Earth 2 Harrison Wells is kind of a dick. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 we discover Earth 2 Harrison Wells... Is a dick. <laughs> I really? Can I say I really enjoy? Holy cow! Tom Cavanaugh returns for this episode, and by his presence, he he brings the show up like ten points. Like oh, he he totally made this episode. The the rest of the, the stuff about Doctor Light was just boring as hell. But that <laughs> Tom Cavanaugh was the that was the reason to watch this episode. That was why I enjoyed it so much. I love his interactions with uh, um, with yeah. Jake Garrett too. Or like, oh yeah. You know, it's like they're clearly they're not. It's not like they're enemies, you know, because they're both like. So it's clearly nipping about the idea that you know Harrison Wells on Earth Two is a villain, or that Harrison Wells considers you know Jake Garrett a villain. Neither of them see that way. They just can't stand each other. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I love that. I love that. Because I really, I hope Harrison Wells is on their side. I ultimately hope he's more or less a good guy. Because yeah. I love the idea that Harrison Wells last season, who was just so charming and was so good at working with people. And he was so seeking to just have everyone do their best. And he was the bad guy. <laughs> and he was yeah, just he was using them all. Guy. And the, yeah. the idea that good Harrison Wells is a douche, I love that contrast. I think that's really kind of fun. Yeah. I don't want him to be evil. I want him to be a good guy, but just... A really I did, guy yeah. He's, he's the good guy that nobody guy. wants to work with because he's such a dick. He's <laughs> such a dick. Exactly. Okay, but his line about, I did really like his line where he says something to Caitlin about and, and will keep anything from... The same thing happening to anyone else that happened to your Robbie or something like that. And she says, Ronnie. And he says, yeah. James. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. He, he did that, too. He, 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 like, he intentionally called Cisco Crisco. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. And like I said, I just loved it when Jay Garrett was talking. You could see Jay Garrett, like, fuming as he's talking to him. Just like, oh, I hate this guy. 
<laughs> oh yeah, they almost got into a fist fight. I I love the dynamic between him and Jay Garrick. I love that they don't get along, and that they they hate each other. And and Jay Garrick because he thinks Harrison Wells is just just bad news, like the stuff that Harrison Wells created the entire problem of Zoom with the accident, which apparently Earth 2 Star Labs had a similar metahuman creating accident as Earth 1 Star Labs. Mm -hmm. And Jay Garrick blames Wells for that. Wells doesn't like Jay Garrick because Jay Garrick apparently is not fast enough or strong enough to stop Zoom. <laughs> and, and the whole reason, well... The new Wells is here in Earth One is because he believes that if Jay Garrick can't stop Zoom, Barry Allen can. We got a little bit of a reveal towards a, a bigger reason why Harrison Wells or two might have crossed the border, and that's that Zoom seems to have his daughter. Yes. So, so. It's also, Zoom seems to have his daughter. This also explains why Harrison Wells is so hell bent on finding a way to stop Zoom beyond just. He wants to be a good person and stop this bad guy. <laughs> Which it seems like he wouldn't have cared otherwise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I really like. Again, he is far and away consistently the most interesting character on the show. Yeah. It's, okay. it's kind of making me think about... Um, did either of you guys... I, I think Kat said she watched some of Fringe, but she didn't like it. Um, did either of you watch... 75% of Fringe. I watched... Okay. The first season of Fringe, and then I kind of fell off. But I liked See, where it was going. Here's my relationship with Fringe. I liked a lot of things about it, but the show was constantly disappointing me because I liked it so much. I felt like it could be so much better, and it just it constantly let me down. You know. Uh, I love the cross-dimensional stuff they did on Fringe, though. I really uh, liked yeah, it. Was, that was interesting. Yeah, and, and that, that, it makes me recall this when I when I'm wa watching the Flash now. I'm like, when you're getting into like the kind of the differing personalities and the kind of conflicts that I come from that, that, that rather than really huge stakes, even though there are really Red huge versus, stakes. Red versus Walter versus Blue versus Walter. Yeah, yeah. 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 This is uh, there's a big fan theory going around now that Zoom is uh, Earth Two Henry Allen, which would Kind of be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, not only that, why he left town? Yeah, right. Exactly. That, that would be a that would that would be amazing. Not only for the impact it would have on Barry, but also be kind of cool because that actor did play the Flash in the '90s show, and that would mm -hmm. kind of be like a way for them to get him to play a similar ro role, only reverse it and have him be a villain. Um, yeah, that'd be really cool. I mean, yeah. we, got a good <laughs> shot of, we got a good shot of Zoom in this episode. I mean, you don't see his face or anything. He's doing the whole, like, I'm shaking my face so fast that it's blurry. Like, <laughs> yeah. Reverse Flash was doing. Yeah. Like, apparently all speedster villains do. Um, but, <laughs> well, it's just the most efficient way for them to yeah. hide their identities. Come on. But, uh, um, uh, we got to see kind of, like, his build. And, like, there were, you know, before there were rumors that it could be, like, Earth 2 Barry Allen. And seeing his build, I'm like, if they, like, unmask him and it's Barry Allen, it's just, like, that'll be ridiculous because yeah. he's, like, so oh, much yeah. uh, No, I, I, don't <laughs> like, I don't want it to be Earth 2 Barry Allen. That'd be but, like, when they showed Zoom, he's so much bigger. Like, Barry Allen's a very kind of small guy. He's a big yeah. male, you know? <laughs> have to bulk up to Oliver Queen size, and I don't yeah. see that happening. What if What if it's Earth 2 Oliver Queen? <laughs> yeah. Okay, no, I so, think that would blow the air, <laughs> a huge hole in the Arrowverse. Just yeah. like, how on earth then would they have time for Oliver Queen to be over on Flash's villain? <laughs> well, you we only have to show him towards the end of the season. Before that, you just have you just have Mr. Shaky Face, Mr. Vibrating Face. No, it's 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 Earth to Tommy. <laughs> Earth no, 2, Earth to 2 Slade Wilson? It has to be someone that's important to Flash. It can't be someone from Arrow. Yeah, it can be. Don't crush our Arrow. hopes, Cat. <laughs> <laughs> I want it to be Earth 2 Slade Wilson. Oh I, want my God. Of the, I want Flash Season 2 to have a deep connection to Arrow Season 2. <laughs> oh, my, oh, oh my God, can you imagine if, if it's Tommy, like the reveal? It's me, Tommy, Barry. Barry's like, Who? 
that would be is a lot of people who watch, watch Flash don't watch Arrow. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's Earth Two Felicity. <laughs> There's there's ac- there's actually a strong fan theory that says it's Patty Spinnet, which I'm like, I don't know where that's coming from. Probably because people are everything out at this point. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a fan theory for everything. I, I think we uh, just created like four ourselves. I, th- I think <laughs> I think the I think the only supporting evidence for Patty Spivet is that she is a new character and that she like comes on the scene and immediately like inserts herself into Barry Allen's life. Um, mm. But other than that... I wonder if, if she has maybe ulterior motives. Yeah, you have to wonder... Well, maybe she... I'm just hoping on the subject of Patty Spivet, I have already find her to be one of the most likable members of the cast. And she's yeah. been around for three episodes and isn't even a main character. Can they please permanently integrate her into the cast? I lo- the I love yeah, once they get her more involved, then she's going to start holding secrets back, too. <laughs> I, I already oh, lo- maybe I she'll be the exception. Yeah. But my point yeah. is, I think she's already a really likable character, and I would yes. love it. Yeah. I already love her more than Iris. Can we just replace Iris? That's with a her? low bar, but I completely agree with you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Name, I think this is well, the well, here's a challenge for you. Name any character on the Flash that isn't Iris. <laughs> Iris, or that's worse than Iris. That isn't Iris. <laughs> and then I'll tell you that I like that character more than Iris. <laughs> <laughs> hey. I think this was the episode where one of the characters was like, Yeah, Iris is all badass and I was like how? <laughs> it's part of the whole uh, tell don't show. It's part of the whole tell don't show us. practice. Yeah. They're gonna try to convince us she's an amazing character by saying she's an amazing character. Yeah. yeah. So she's a terrible character. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, what else do we got to talk about with uh, this episode of the Flash? Here you go. You just said name one character on the Flash, and you'll tell me if you like. Like them better than Iris, uh, King Shark. I like King Shark better than Iris. <laughs> <laughs> Poor I'm Iris. You know, I don't even think her characterization is bad. Just the it's way not the actress that's terrible. Reliably it's, it's, terrible. It's not the actress. There's two things. There's two problems. Oh, no. One is that she and Barry just don't have a good natural chemistry, which they Agreed. should. And the second also, problem is the writing. Yeah. And you can't create chemistry, you know? Like, that's not... that You can't put the fault on that on the actress, you know? And I completely agree. And they really need to get for her own story for her own sake. Because up until this point, all of her stories have been, like, being the object of Barry's affections, um, being kidnapped by various people, uh, people keeping secrets from her, being engaged to a guy who ended up being more important than her and then died and then having her mother show up for the sole purpose of introducing Wally West. Like, it wasn't even yeah. for Iris's own sake. It was for the purpose of... Yeah. Introducing Hold Wally on, it gets even thing. worse. What you We're just brought up... Forward. What you just brought up, Kat, gets even worse. Being connected to somebody romantically who's more important than her and then dies. <laughs> who... Hold on. Who was mocked by somebody else for not for being the least important person in the family. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so Iris pretty much is... I, Iris is Gotham-level bad. <laughs> like, yeah. She, yeah. she's really bad. So I hope for Candace Patton's sake they find some way to improve her character, because, wow, right. I don't think Candace Patton is bad at all in the role. I just How about... No, Candace Patton is, is great. Is a great actress. Is great in the role. It's just yeah, the character. It's just is, the role sucks. Yeah, the role sucks. <laughs> they 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 need to do something to specifically for that character because everything everything about that character is a conduit for something else. She's just a conduit for other story parts to happen for other characters' sake, and mm. it's like yeah. She needs something to happen to her for her own sake to enrich her character. She's a character without any agency and without any, like, uh, uh, kind of purpose. Like, real... I mean, they they, they made a, a thing this season where she tracked up information on her mom and said, I'm an investigative reporter. And it's like, that's the first time she's ever actually done anything... <laughs> 
you know, <laughs> a showing of any skill level as an investigative reporter, and it wasn't that impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and like like all the other characters, I think fit within their in the, within the boundaries of being related to Team Flash in some way. They all contribute to that. She yeah, doesn't. she doesn't. Yeah, she's. I was kind of hoping they would have her do that once she was brought in on the secret, but instead they keep just getting distracted with her doing other things. Yeah, having mommy drama and yeah, <laughs> secret brother drama. Yeah. yeah, secret mother. And, and the, yeah, again, they're using her as a way to elevate uh, um, the position of her pretend, her secret brother. Her so using her to elevate oh, her character. As I, well. yeah. I should add her secret brother who hasn't shown up, who hasn't shown up yet who, is already more important than her. Who is de- <laughs> who is des- who is destined to show up and become the Flash, and be way more important than her. <laughs> yeah. really, I think maybe it would be great at this point if they just said just completely deviated from everything involving Iris in the comics and might give her superpowers or something right. yeah it's, do something just very different with her yeah or just kill her it's <laughs> <laughs> kind of something when they could practically remove her from the show at this point and I think it it would barely be felt. She's yeah. gonna go upstairs holding a basketball. <laughs> the last we ever see her. And I think so far, in just in just three episodes so far, Patty Patty and Barry have way better chemistry anyway. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah it's it just I don't know. It just makes sense too. I, I don't know. Patty Spivitz. I don't remember the name of the actor who plays her, but she's just. She's really delightful and charming, and she just makes it really hard not to like her. And She's got kind of like a, a an Osgood character to characterization to her. Yeah, and then, yeah. yeah. And, and Iris is just I don't know. I think because she was set up solely to be the object of Barry's affection is just from the start she's been a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Again, again, I want to clarify that all of us have basically said this is the writing, not the actress. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, just to clarify, the acting is fine, the writing just is bad. Yeah, it's just they, they haven't done anything with her. So, I mean, I think that's that's pretty much it for what we're going to talk about with The Flash. Do you guys have yeah, anything yeah. else to say about The Flash? Well, let's see what I talk about Dr. Light, but pretty run of the mill. <laughs> we'll see what they do with her this next episode. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Let's talk about what, what it looks like next episode's going to bring, which is it looks like we're going to get our first actual confrontation between the Flash yeah. and potentially between the Flash and Zoom. Yeah, um, it's uh, inter-Zoom. I already saw the stills of Zoom and fighting Barry Allen. So this is going to be a pretty, pretty big episode um, as far as that goes. I'm looking forward to it. Not expecting any major reveals, but yeah, un- unlikely. Unlikely. Um, but the, but the, this is going to be similar to last season, where the first confrontation with Reverse Flash. I'm expecting yeah. an episode similar to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're going to basically have Barry get his ass kicked and find out that he's not ready. Exactly. <laughs> pretty much. I don't think they're going to go that tack because I mean he was so explicit about it at the end of his last episode that. He thinks he'll, he can win because he's not going it alone. Yeah. Right. So I, I feel like I give them credit. I don't think they're going to go the predictable route here. I totally get what you're saying. You think it's going to go that way because that would be my first guess too. It's just because it's too early in the season. Out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but I'm ex- hoping to be surprised. I don't know. Maybe, maybe the next episode... Barry fights Zoom, and then Oliver shows up with more of his uh, re- reverse flash, like, power-disabling arrows. <laughs> well, Oliver Queen did take down the reverse flash for him in last season. Yeah, Which Oliver was Queen. pretty cool. I didn't even cool. grow up reading DC Comics, and I was like, hey, Green Arrow's writing reverse flash. This is so dirty. I love it. And that was so dirty. That was the last thing I was expecting. I, I was expecting, like, the Green Arrow to take out the reverse flash for Barry last season. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end, it's just like a conversation between Barry and, and uh, mm-hmm. Oliver. And Oliver's yeah. like, geez, Barry, get your fucking act together. <laughs> 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 you got your 
your own show. You can't even beat your own villain. Thanks, Bob. Then Barry sinks his head and it plays like the Peanuts. Oliver's like, like, da, 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 Oliver's da, like da, da. I, I, I just had to beat Ra's al Ghul and then I had to come to your show and beat your villain. Come on. <laughs> 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 At least make yourself useful and get me a latte. <laughs> Give me a flash. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, the, the flash drink. It's so weird every time every time they say that, like Cisco's ordering. But that that's something else we can talk about. What do you think of Cisco's potential new love interest? It's not gonna be his love interest for very long. She's going to a completely different show and she has and she has already has a love interest history with uh, another uh, guy. Yeah. yeah, I already knew that the actor is playing Hot Girl, <laughs> and I recognized her in that first scene, so I was like, well, this isn't going to go anywhere. Hi, hi, nice to meet you, Hot Girl. More is that up for Legends of Tomorrow. Okay. Right. <laughs> so we're going to have, so all this means to me is that we're going to have the episode where Cisco goes on a date with Hot Girl, and it's all about her, and it's all set up for Legends of Tomorrow. <laughs> that's I mean but that again that's we've said that before this is what I think the first half of both Flash and Arrow this season is largely going to be about set up for Legends of Tomorrow and then like the real kind of like more focused stories for the individual shows are going to kick off after the mid season mm-hmm. I think that's what's going to be and, and then you're going to have you know Legends of Tomorrow come in probably before the other shows and it's going to lead in that way. I think so. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what makes sense, you know? <laughs> Who knows, you know? But uh, only the only the Flash and Arrow writers know, but uh, <laughs> we'll have to see. But that, that pr- pretty much brings us to an end here for this. So uh, Will and I are going to stick around and talk about Arrow, but Kat's going to leave us on that. So, uh Thank you for joining us, Kat, and uh, we'll talk to you again on the podcast. Sounds good. Okay. Bye. Okay, now it's time for Arrow. So uh, Mm. we're talking about what was probably the best episode of Arrow this season. No omelets, though. Unfortunately, no omelets. No omelets. (laughs) No no ruined omelets with a... Oh, man. Seriously? (laughs) We still haven't seen how the omelet was buried. (laughs) <laughs> so, yeah, right. So Constantine, Matt Ryan showed back up in the role, and he absolutely killed it. In the season four, episode six, episode Haunted. Yep. Matt Ryan, uh, how do you how do you feel about? Because we we were talking before um, when we were talking about the show, like how they were going to introduce how Constantine and Oliver had some kind of connection. So we got the answer to that, like, very clearly <laughs> um, in this episode. What did you think about that, about the con- the way they made their connection? Do you think it worked? Do you think it made sense? Um, yeah, I thought it worked. It actually did work, which was <laughs> the most amazing part of the episode. Mm-hmm. So now we know that the island that Oliver, that, uh, Oliver landed on all that all those seasons ago is actually the island from Lost. It's the <laughs> all sorts of mystical stuff going on and basically <laughs> military oh, groups on it. And <laughs> what's what's interesting, and 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 these things these guys think they can sneak something past me, but actually the object. That uh, Constantine was the, on the island for. I missed you what there? you just said there. Okay, oh. that's what I thought because I noticed it froze. Um, the object that Constantine was on the island for, mm-hmm. that was the Orb of Horus. And that is like very important to Hawkman's lore. Oh. Uh, yeah, that has something to do with Hawkman, Hawkgirl. So more Legends of Tomorrow teasing. Constantine just wanted the staff of... Uh... <laughs> staff of, yeah. We wanted the staff. The staff held the real power. Uh, but yeah, so uh, we've established this as now a mystical, magical island. And not just the... Uh, it's, it's the Lost Island. 
pretty much. <laughs> Somebody already brought this up in the It's all these thing. different military groups and stuff and different, you know, groups fighting each other. And you have the Mirakuru, which is like kind of, I guess, the Dharma initiative and their science yeah. research. And now you're getting like the others with uh, the mystical side. And we're probably going to end up finding more people connected to the mystical side on the island. Right. Besides just so relics. The, ne the, the, ne the next season is going to be how uh, Oliver finds himself having to push a button all the time in order yeah. to save the world. Yeah. Save the world, yeah. Yeah, to save the world. That's why it took that one extra year. <laughs> so they finally made this season's flashback story work. Unfortunately, I feel like they did that just for um, Constantine, and then they're going to go right back to like what they were doing before. But I'm hoping what they do is now that Constantine's mentioned that the reason those men are on the island is not for the drugs, it's for something else. I'm hoping that comes out in the season. Yeah. That, that wasn't just to give Constantine a reason to be there. I'm hoping that, yeah. you know, we start introducing more mystical elements I mean, on the island. It, it, it's very obvious that they needed... They needed a reason why Constantine's going to show up on the show and do this. Oliver's going to pull a giant cork out of a hole yeah. and light's going to be shining out of it. <laughs> it, was, it. And, you know, so they had to have that connection. And obviously there was no real natural way for them to draw a connection between Oliver and Constantine unless they somehow met on the island. And I, I think, I mean, it's pretty... It's pretty paper thin, but I think the way they did it worked. Um, having Oliver go on that little adventure with Constantine, you know, it was fun. <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> fun. Here's the last Stark vibe to it with them, you know, yeah. coming into the temple, and you know, it was fun. And then, and then, and then, and then it also, you know, it made it work why they were like so cool with each other later on in the main story. Why Oliver could just call Constantine up and have him come. Because he's not the kind of person who's just like, you know, the just random people call him and he'll do favors. You know, it's like yeah. <laughs> so it's, like, it, it's it's also besides that, um, we talked before this uh, this uh, um, podcast starter, this video cast started that we'd like to see more of Constantine, and that you know, there's you know, hopefully this could be you know, spur on the CW to, to renew Constantine as a CW series. See, um, the problem with I that... I think this also, hold on, but I, th I think this also, what they did in this episode, establishes something that Constantine could be that's more interesting than what Constantine was. What Constantine was was kind of like this case of the week, you know, like, oh, there's stuff, there's, there's a kind of darker thing going on in the background, but then at the same time, there's like... Um, you know, there's things he's he's saving different people in the city or something. What could be more interesting is if they did like what Constantine was doing on the island. If they made that kind of thing more of his focus, like he's going in and like finding rare artifacts and he's hunting them down. That would be a much more interesting Constantine than what Constantine ended up being <laughs> before. Right. Right, definitely. So I just think they inadvertently um, like answered a question about how they could have made Constantine better. <laughs> one of the things is one of the things. Well, I was gonna say one of the reasons CW might not want to renew Constantine on their network is because they already have Supernatural, and that is a very, very similar type show, very similar premise. Um, mm -hmm. It's no secret that Supernatural itself was heavily inspired by Hellblazer. Uh, you know, so it's kind of. <laughs> It would give yeah. them an opportunity to put the two back to back, though, which is what they should do. Is what they should, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. have Constantine on at eight and Supernatural on at nine. Then you, then you know, they eventually should just put a Flash and Arrow back to back instead of on separate nights. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, Flash and Arrow should be back to back on the same. They got night. you know my crazy ex girlfriend and Jane the Virgin. Those two fit together, and those are on the same night. You know, they got the yeah. Vampire Diaries and the originals, but those on the same night. You know, they they could do it. They, they could do, do it. it. They totally. They do just it. need to pair something up with Eye Zombie. Yes. <laughs> Maybe Eye Vampire. Eye <laughs> Zombie, Android Zombie. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, so yeah, uh, Constantine worked on Arrow. We're hoping to see more of him. He probably won't get his own show. That's just kind of like wishful thinking on my part. Yeah, it's but, wishful thinking. It's not going to happen. But well, I'd love to see him pop up like I frequently. Hope he, yeah, I, I, hope, I hope he shows up more. Maybe in Legends of Tomorrow. Or The Flash. Yeah, I just kind of pop up around the universes. Yeah. I think he'd be actually kind of fun, like him interacting with Barry Allen would be kind of fun. It would be fun. Because they're very different characters. <laughs> they're very different characters. And uh, Constantine despises superheroes. So yeah. he, he would totally not get along with Barry Allen <laughs> at all. He'd just be making digs at him the whole time. <laughs> he'd be more of a dick than Harrison Wells. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, and that was the best part of this Flash episode. So that's yeah, right there. It would probably work. Yeah, right. <laughs> so let's talk about what Constantine actually did in this episode besides the flashback. Um, Constantine was brought in, as we expected, to uh, bring Sarah's soul back. Um, this is another setup. That, surprise. The legends of behind, tomorrow. Yes, behind all the Constantine smoke screen, this is actually another setup episode for Legends of Tomorrow. <laughs> We're still doing this. Yeah. Yep, definitely. And this, this is explaining how Sarah becomes the white canary that we see in the Legends of Tomorrow trailer. And yes. So this episode is actually all about Sarah. Um, there's some... I'm trying to think what happened outside of like the main plot. Oh yeah. <laughs> um Sarah, there was actually a really good scene where Sarah goes after Thea. It was like really tense. And like oh, I, I really know. thought she was getting pummeled in that scene and I felt really bad. And it, <laughs> there's one like like they made a gif of it. It's funny when you watch the gif, but it like made sense in the context. Like she's running away and she tries to like you know, do some parkour over a railing and she she whiffs it and she ends up falling down the stairs. And, <laughs> and it's it's like, well, when you watch a scene, it's like, yeah, it makes sense because she's like pretty badly beat up at that point. But taking yeah. out of context, it's like the most hilarious thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> parkour mistake, yeah. Yeah, parkour mistake. Um <laughs> but that was like a really good that was like a really good scene I thought I mean because it wasn't like your typical arrow fight it was like sure Thea could defend herself but Sarah especially in that feral state was much stronger and Thea really well, even outside of the feral state I mean yeah. I think that they make Thea and um, and uh, uh, God, uh, uh, Laurel, Laurel. Laurel, I think they, they make them seem like they're much stronger than they should actually be. Yeah. Like Sarah and Oliver are on a different level. You know what I mean? They're like, they they had to fight for their lives. Like but legitimately think, fight for their lives for years. And they both had like severe and major training that lasted more than like, you know, some, a few sessions with a boxer. Out, but like this scene, <laughs> this scene like, Thea really takes a beating. She's like really damaged. She ends up in the hospital. I yeah. think somebody pointed out that this is like one of the first times in a show where they where like a character got into a fight and it, they made it seem like they really took a beating instead mm -hmm. of, you know, what usually happens where they get stabbed or shot, then they're okay pretty much. Well, and that, I mean, that's the way it should be. You know, it's like, like I said, you have characters like Oliver and Sarah and you could also add in like, you know, Malcolm Merlin or something like that. These are like legitimate threat characters, you know? Right, right. <laughs> and then you have like Laurel and, uh, uh, well, it's like Oliver and Sarah and, you know, all people like that. They're like, they're like Marines. And uh, uh, um, uh, like Laurel and, um, and Thea, yeah. they're, they're like the National Guard. Yeah, they're, they're, they're weekend like, warriors, you know? I mean, that's not, you know, dig against the National Guard, but obviously Marines are in training constantly. They're constantly doing it. They're constantly put into battle. National Guard are people that hold down jobs and then also on the weekends, you know? <laughs> and you're not going to, you know, 
somebody in the National Guard is not going to compete with a Marine. You know what I mean? And and I think that that's important that they showed that, and I think they did a good job of that. I think they did. Yeah, they did a good job with that. That's what I thought. Oh, and then Laurel's eye-rolling speech at Oliver Queen. Where she's like, <laughs> oh, my God. She, like, just – can. She like takes everything that's happening. She's so deflecting it, the whole time. <laughs> yeah. and, she, and she put she puts it all on Oliver. Like I saw somebody made like a screen capture where she's like, where she's like, I'm, yeah, where she's like, I'm so I'm sorry, my, I'm sorry, my sister is running around killing a bunch of people and attempted to kill your sister, and then, and that <laughs> and that I that I resurrected that I resurrected her. And that I also went behind your back and visited Malcolm Merlin, and he and and also and also your sister killed a bunch of people while she was there. But have you ever considered how I feel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's oh god. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Laurel. Nah. It's funny that they actually made the joke though with uh, um, uh, uh, what was it uh, with Laurel's dad and and Oliver where they were like, you know, talking about Laurel's constant lying. You know, <laughs> it was like it's oh, so she lied to, she lied to me that my daughter was dead, and she lied to you that she brought her back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh I guess one thing you can say about Laurel's character is she's consistent. Right, she's just a, <laughs> just a pathological liar. Yeah. Oh God, she's she's that element of the show. Right now, she's the element of the show. Not always, but right now, she's the element of the show that um, has that Smallville feeling to it. You know, yeah. she's that like I have to keep a secret. It's like Cisco trying to keep the secret in the Flash. I'm so glad that's out out of the yeah, back on the flash because if they I were going to turn that into like some tense situation like him actually hiding it caused like a legitimate problem i was going to get really frustrated but uh thankfully they got that out of the bag but laurel's still like you know proven chaos theory by <laughs> lying to everyone about everything right you, you'd think she'd learn at this point yeah you, 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 but no so what's she gonna lie about next Hide from everybody. Oh man, I, I, yeah, I, I, I really hate that kind of storytelling. Where like yeah. you know, like because it's so stupid. Yeah, it's like, like meaningless conflict. Yeah, it's like you should know better. Conflict. <laughs> that was like that. Her hiding her sister's death was like the worst part of season three for me because it was like so much meaningless conflict between her and her father. That did not have to happen, mm. and you know, and I felt just like cheap in the plot, and it's like, just tell him, he has a right to know. <laughs> stop, stop being a dip, Laurel. So the other uh, big thing we got this episode, which is I believe how the episode ended, uh, had to do with uh, Felicity and Ray Palmer and Mister Terrific. Ah, uh, yes. So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so basically Felicity finds out Ray Palmer's still alive. And again, we're more further set up for Legends of Tomorrow because we have to have the Adam episode next. I'm looking forward to it though. It'll be good to see Ray Palmer again. It will it's be. a cool contrast to Oliver because he's so like positive and chipper. Yeah, he's, so, <laughs> oh, yeah, he's not... He's not like dour and brooding like Oliver is. Yeah. Although Oliver, Oliver is more in good spirits. That's another thing, right? Uh, oh yeah, Oliver running for mayor. <laughs> He's still running for mayor. Still uh, running for yeah. Mayor. We we talked last week, I believe. Last week was when when they revealed um, his his campaign office, right? Yeah, and, <laughs> and everyone was like, "He's I'm running for mayor," and everyone's like, "That's a terrible idea." <laughs> no, this this week it was, this week it was his campaign manager that they had yeah. being a douche and telling him to distance himself from his friends because of stuff. And he's like, "No, I'm not going to do that. You're an idiot." <laughs> <laughs> it's like, 
Yeah, I think that guy's going to end up playing more of a part as well. He's been in a few things. Uh, the actor he was on a he was on a TV show about these three brothers in the military um, that were kind of doing like a meaningless job in the it was pretty funny comedy on Fox. Can't remember the oh. name of it. Hmm. And he was on a um, suburgatory too, playing like kind of the stereotypical dumb jock character. Oh, that. Okay. So, so he's played a few kind of like significant roles where they put some focus on him. So I got to imagine that they're going to do more with him than just make him the campaign manager because he's kind of a young, fit actor. You know, <laughs> he's a young actor who's in great shape. So they got to end up probably doing more with him. Um, yeah, definitely. So we'll have to see what that is. Hopefully it's not just like, oh, this whole time he was part of the, you know, hive or something. <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, he's totally going to be high. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> that ain't all right. But, yeah. Uh, we'll have to see what they do with that, though. Um, Damien Dark continues to kill oh, it. Oh, yeah, that's right. We forgot Diggle found, Diggle found out more information about his brother and why his brother was killed. And it was not good information. Apparently, his brother was into some shady stuff. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was nice. It it was nice seeing uh, Diggle get a scene with Captain Lance because that's never happened before. In the Where movie. they weren't just passive aggressive the whole time, and right. Well, it was <laughs> like it, it's it's also it's also like the, those two are like the the most no BS characters out of it, it, all the characters on Arrow. It's mm -hmm. like if if any character is going to be just straightforward and you know, not, not come up with a bunch of BS. It's going to be them too. And so them two having a scene, it was like, and being refreshingly honest with each other. And they quickly nice. resolved an issue between them, which I liked. I like that yes. when they introduced them working together, it was like dig all talking about, so, you know, these people and they killed my brother and you worked with them. <laughs> and, and he's like, Lance is like, uh, is this going to be a problem with us working together? I had no idea. And he's like, no, because <laughs> you're going to yeah. help us get close to him. So it's yeah. like, like, okay, resolved. And then yeah, like resolved. Lance still felt like a feeling of some kind of obligation. They had to do something to make up for it. So he got, gets the information on Diggle's brother, presents it to him. They kind of get, get a conclusion on it, come to peace. It's like, okay, yeah, this is like, the yeah. no, no hormonal BS. <laughs> yeah. Can can every can every character on Arrow just be like and drop handle drama like this? Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, and it's good to see Diggle further and further away from uh, brooding Diggle that from this earlier in the season. So yeah, it's yeah, it, it it's good. I don't <laughs> know if like this new information is going to make him further brood or what. But, but you know, yeah, it's like he was blaming Oliver before, and so at least like now he doesn't have some like way to the blame line, him. The line was like uh, Diggle said something to Lance, like "Thank you," and 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 then Lance is like, "Thank, thank you, you thank you. You don't thank me for a punch to the gut." Yeah, or no, he said, <laughs> he said a he said a gut uh, a gut punch doesn't deserve a thank you. Or something. yeah, a gut punch doesn't deserve a thank you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So that was good. So yeah, um, I I definitely feel after this episode, I have much higher hopes for Arrow continuing on in this season, where I was kind of still feeling like it was continuing on from the faults of season three before. Yeah. I definitely feel like okay, this is feeling better okay. than season three. This is, already. Yeah, this to me this this feels like a much stronger season than season three. This this feels like it has everything working for it. It's it's not as good as season two, but yeah, this is nowhere near. Not right much now. is not not much not in much. these superhero shows is going to top season two of Arrow. I'd say yeah. I'd say the only thing that's of the comic book shows that's topped season two of Arrow was season one of Daredevil. Yeah, definitely. I think yeah. I think otherwise season two of Arrow uh, beats out any of the seasons of Agents of Shield. Beats out. Um, Agent Carter beats out The Flash both seasons. Beats out the <laughs> scene of Supergirl so far. Yeah. Beats out Gotham. <laughs> oh, oh, I I think every single one of those beats out Gotham. 
Yeah, no, I agree. Season two of Arrow, like only Daredevil has surpassed that so far. Yeah, um, Jessica Jones uh, probably will. Um, Jessica Jones probably, from what I saw that, definitely. Um, but yeah, but season four of Arrow, this is very solid. It looks like it's streamlined. It looks like they know where they're going. Um, there's no meandering BS. No, no, the pointless drama is being toned down to a minimum. Mm-hmm. Um, so so far, so good. It seems like they they learned some very real lessons from season three, which I I was worried about that they won it because you know there was still there was there's still like this Felicity and Oliver relationship. But Which they, they didn't. They toned down this episode, and you notice that too. Like they yeah. didn't give a lot of Felicity Oliver screen time, and like their relationship isn't so offensive to me when you don't see them together all the time. Right. So exactly. if exactly. they're going to keep them in a lasting relationship, I hope they do it this way, where it's just kind of an, you know, it's it's yeah. in the fringe corners and you don't really see it because I mean, it was yeah. frustrating before. I I, th- I think part of the reason is, I yeah, they're definitely dialing that down. It's still a thing, but at mm-hmm. least they're dialing it down to the point where now it's not obnoxious and constantly in your face and character ruining yeah. and all of this yeah. stuff that was wrong with season three when they did this. And also what I like about it is that they're doing stuff with Felicity that has nothing to do with Oliver. So they're giving her her own storylines to do, like the Ray Palmer thing. That's going to be mostly a Felicity storyline. They gave her... Mr. Terrific as another character for Felicity to interact with and be part of her story. To and and I think uh and I think he plays very well off of Felicity. There was a great line this episode where like we're 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 like he, he sings like some jargon and then Felicity says, Ah, oh, this is this is what talking to me must be like. <laughs> so like it's really good stuff so now she's got to hook up with him before he becomes mr terrific so she can finish her uh her harem of superheroes yeah right she's got to hook up with every superhero oh god that'd be so wrong Especially- she's gonna show up she's gonna show up randomly on like next season of daredevil Especially because she's going to be I experimented in college with this girl named Jessica. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it'd be especially wrong because if she hooks up with him, because a he's gay and b he's married, <laughs> pretty happily, from what I understand. So yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah. So <laughs> she's going to get a sex change so she can hook up with him. <laughs> And then change back. <laughs> and then change back. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of brings us to an end of our talk about Arrow. So now we've we've talked about the show. So uh, there isn't too much else to talk about right now. Uh, we will be talking about Agent Carter as more information comes out. We talked about some of the new recent news about that um, on the last podcast. Um, there's some castings. Uh, we'll just kind of go over that real quick right now, which is... Uh, um, yeah, I can't remember the names of the actors that were cast. Uh, I don't know, Red Foreman, <laughs> yeah, Red, Red from uh, uh, uh that 70s show, yeah, uh, he was also in Pro Cop. He's, he's gonna be there to call Peggy Carter a dumbass, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, and uh, Ken Marino, uh, Ken who's you know, you know, from every comedy you've ever seen in the last like 15 years. Um, and, uh, he played a, a PI on Veronica Mars. That was like, uh, uh, Veronica's dad's competition in Veronica Mars where, you know, people who listen to this podcast probably watched Veronica Mars. If not that you might know him from the state or what, how American summer or any other myriad of shows. But yeah, uh, he's going to be playing a villain, which we all seem to be kind of excited about just because he's a very charismatic actor, and that hopefully means a very charismatic villain. Um, that was one of the issues, villain-wise, with uh, Agent Carter last year was that there wasn't a charismatic villain. Um, mm-hmm. It's one of the best things about Arrow this year is that there is a charismatic villain, you know? So, uh, yeah, it's 
looking forward to that and what he's going to bring to the table. Uh, that's pretty much all we have on that, though. So, But as more information comes out, we know it's going to be taking place in Hollywood rather than New York. It's going to deal with that kind of the glitz and glamour of that era of Hollywood. So uh, that's going to be fun to see how they do that. They did a lot with like how they brought um, New York to life. Um, that older New York to life in uh, Agent Carter. So it's going to be exciting to see what they do with Hollywood. I'm yeah, expecting definitely. it to kind of look like, you know, have you ever played the L.A. Noir video game? Yeah, yeah. I'm expecting something along those lines, like look-wise, you know. So it's going to be cool to see a bunch of people in, like, these big boat car convertibles <laughs> driving around, you know, and the glitz and all the glamour and stuff. It's going to be kind of cool to see that in, in uh, Agent Carter. So Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, so that's going to come up in the mid-season. We'll get to that more. We'll get to talking about that more as we approach the end of the year. Um, but until then, we'll be talking about these three shows, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., The Flash, and Arrow. Uh, this has been TVE versus Marvel and DC, Episode 5. Thank you, everybody, for watching. My name is Tyson Gifford. I am the host of this podcast. You can reach me on Twitter, at Tyson Gifford. Uh, you can check out our website, tventhusiast.com. Uh, check out our YouTube channel, everything else. You can find more of these videos. You can find all of our podcasts, which goes up every Friday called The Weekly Set. We just did episode 32 last week, doing 33 this week. So uh, you can check out that as well. You can subscribe to that on any uh, podcast client, uh, iTunes, anything like that. Uh, joining me today was Will Rorig, who is still on the line with us. Uh, he can be reached on Twitter at Voxel Hero. You can check out uh, any stories he puts up on the site. Do you have anything to plug? No, not at the moment. And uh, Kat Taylor was joining us earlier in the episode. She had to take off because she's, she's holding off on some Arrow episodes to binge. So we're letting her take off before we discuss Arrow every week. Uh, she has written an article recently about uh, the Quantico experiment that, that ABC was doing with how to structure the series to make it like move at a really fast pace and how she had some issues with that. You can check that out on our website at tventhusiast.com. Uh, that's pretty much it. So thank you, everybody, for watching TVE versus Marvel NDC Episode 5. Good night. Good night.